this I call A. Okay. Now you remember I talked about we're going to solve this thing is we're going to create a residual, right? Remember, we got a it's the residual is sort of the the out of balance the the out of balance vector, right? So if I just guess the W and put it into that equation, is not going to be equal to zero, right? If I guess the correct W, then I then it's equal to zero. Right? Um, and so what we do is we 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 take a guess, we compute the out of balance portion of that thing, and then we use this Newton Rapp Center optimization routine to minimize that residual. Okay. And uh, yeah, so basically we need to code that equation, right? Okay. Huh? Uh, you'll see. You'll see. So th that, by the way, that elastic influence function, you know, it, it's the same every time. So it's just a sort of an initialization step. So this, all this code at the beginning that parses my inputs, and then it also just runs this function on initialization. So at the, so at the end of the initialization, it computes that big A thing, and I have it available to me. So it does that by you know running this can create grid and elastic influence function. And, uh, you know, by the way, another thing I like about Python you know, it sort of bugs me. I don't like about MATLAB is that you know here you, you can combine multiple functions into one file. Right, so everywhere you see def, that's a that's a function, and I can just put them one on top of one another in one file. You know, MATLAB, all of those would have to be separate files, right? And and I think I've told you guys earlier, you know, in the class, it's good it's good coding practice to create small functions, right? Because you can test those small functions in isolation. Well, that what that means in MATLAB is that you have a whole damn file system full of full of files for every tiny little function, right? And it's sort of annoying. So now I'm going to I'm going to uh, create a function uh, called compute residual. Okay, the the what it's going to take as an argument. And again, just forget about these cells. What it's going to take as an argument is the width at the time step n plus one. Right. That's my that's my guess, right? And we're going to try to reduce this thing. Or, you know, get get to the correct value of this thing so that the residual vector is zeros. Right. That's the goal. So, uh, I just want to, I, I don't even know that this needs to be there, but remember we have these sort of two ghost grids on the, on the end? Uh, I just want to just ensure that they're always zero. So I'm just going to go ahead and say the width at NP1 uh, at the, at the minus one and the last one is equal to zero, and likewise at the second to last one. Okay. Um, then you remember uh, that here the pressure is equal to. A times W, right? This is just a matrix vector multiplication, right? So it does A times W. Okay? So that that's the pressure. So that's just in the syntax of NumPy, the dot product of A with with NP the width at NP1. So the width is coming in as an argument. It's going to have the you know the length that's associated with this guy, and that will do a, a matrix vector multiplication and return me a pressure vector. Okay. Um, so then my residual vector, I want to be zeros like pressure. So it's just a vector that has zeros in it, and it's the same size as pressure. And now we're going to code that up. We're going to code this equation up. 
So we have the width at NP1, and it's going to go from 1 to minus 1, uh, and that's cubed minus width. Minus two cubed. Okay, so remember, we have these two. We have these two ghost cells over here, right? And our finite difference is i plus one minus i. So it's this minus this, this minus that, this minus that, this minus that, this minus that. Okay. Now I don't. This is only for that pressure term. So I don't need this one. So I'm gonna, you know, this is all I really need to compute, because those are zero, because the width is zero, and the pressure is zero, right? So I don't need to do my computation over those dummy ones. And so what I, what I'm just gonna do is, I'm gonna start from, I'm gonna go from, um, actually, I, I, it's okay to do. Now I'm thinking about it, it's okay to do it. Uh, I just want my vector to be the same. It, over there, it's gonna be two less, right? Uh, so I'm just going to stop it so that I have the same length vectors because I need to add that first term to that second term. And if I if I don't stop it in the right place, then that first term will be one longer. You know, have one more entry than this guy. Okay. So so that's sort of what that does, right? I take the width. You know, I'm just this is that first term, right? So I'm going. From one, which is the second entry, to one from the end, I'm leaving off that last big block, and then I'm going from the beginning, which is the first entry, to two from the end. Right? So I'm skipping the computation over the last big block. This is the finite difference calculation for that first term. Um, and then I divide that by dx, you know, the grid block size. Uh, then I have, then I multiply that by the pressure gradient, right? Pressure, and it's also going to use that same forward difference approximation. And then divide that by. dx. Um, then, so that is the first two terms. That's my equation. This equation. So that's the first two terms I've just coded up, keeping in mind that I just already have a variable that's aw is pressure. Since it appears everywhere, I don't want to recompute. I mean, I could put the dot product there, but I'd be doing it twice, and there's no need to do that. Right? I just do it once and store the product of you know the vector a times w. I store it in that pressure vector, and then I just plug it in there. So that's pressure minus. So that that term is a pressure gradient. Now I have this second derivative in pressure here. Okay. So the second derivative uh, is um, width np1 goes from 0 to 2 from the end. So I'm not going to calculate those two ghost grid, grid blocks here. I only need those for the computation of the gradient, which occurs here. So that's going to be the pressure. 2 to the end, so remember I'm doing a backwards difference, so I want to start here because I'm going to subtract that one and that one, right, to get my second derivative, and that goes all the way to the end, so I have here at the end I subtract that one and that one, or I don't, not, not subtract them, but I use them in the, in the computation. 
So I have the pressure two from the end um, minus two times the pressure one from the minus one um, plus the pressure from the beginning to two from the end. Right? And then all of that is divided by squared. And then the last thing I have is the time dependent term. So the width over the grid blocks I care about minus the width. And here, this is what I, I have a variable that I'm going to store called the width. This is the old width, if you will, or the width of the previous time step. So this should be actually width at NP1. Then, So this is the value I'm going to store from time step to time step. This is the value that comes in as an argument that I'm trying to minimize. Right? So at the, end of, at the end of the minimization routine, I'll actually do a swap where this will become that, right? the old width. Because I'm going to store the width at every time step as the simulation progresses. And that's divided by dt. Right? So there's my residual vector. And then you asked about what I do at q. Remember, I'm going to inject fluid only in the first entry, that's how I'm going to do it. So this, this computes the whole vector at once. Right? Now I could, I could create Q that's like a, you know, has my entry in the first entry and then it's zeros and then I could have just added it there. But there, you know, this is just, the, it's always going to be the first, the first value, right? The first grid block, the well, right? is where we're going to inject. So I can just do this. So what this does, what this operation does, is it just takes what that is plus equals means take whatever's in the first entry and add that to it. Okay. And then return the residual vector. OK. So in the time remaining, uh, <clears throat> So now I have a function to compute residual, and I want to compute one time step. So ultimately, we're going to run this for a long time, but let's, we're, I'm going to create a function that just computes one time step. Right? So for a given delta t, compute the width. And then at the end of that, is, I, I'm going to store that width to compute another time step with a you know, new width. And then I'm keep, keep going like that. And you remember, this is where, in, in the notes last time, I derived the newton raphson iteration that you had to like compute the Jacobian of the residual, right? Because remember, what comes back from this is a vector, and you'd have to compute the Jacobian, which means you'd have to basically take the derivative of that vector with respect to every single change in width, every change in width with every at every cell, and that's sort of a pain to do. You can do it uh, by hand. You, you just do, do like a finite difference calculation on the residual vector itself. The beautiful thing is, we're engineers. We're just going to use optimization routines that are built in. In MATLAB, I think you'd use like FNN search, right? Because this is essentially an optimization routine, right? We're trying to drive that residual vector to zero. So, so we're trying to come up with the optimal W that gets the residual close to zero as possible. Right? So it's sort of an op. I mean, these are it's a gradient-based optimization routine, and there's a very efficient one in in SciPy called the Newton Krylov routine. And it's efficient because it doesn't Construct that Jacobian. The Jacobian can get very large, and you know, Jacobian's the size of the number of grids times the size of the number of grids. So if you had 50,000 grids, it'd be 50,000 by 50,000, and that can be very expensive to construct it and store it. And there's a little bit more efficient way to do it based on this Newton-Krylov method. Again, I think in MATLAB you just use something like FNN search, right? So basically what the arguments, and there's lots of optional arguments to the newton krylov method, but the ones you have to have are the function that you're trying to compute the minimum of, 
That's the function I just defined, right? And an initial guess. Well, my initial guess is this is going to be zero. You know, at, the, at the zero time step, there's zero width, and I'm going to start injecting fluid. Okay. And so, just to make sure, I'm going to go back one more time uh, to my version control system, and then. Um, so then, now I should be able to, if I run this code, and then I run that function, compute time step. Okay. So after one tiny little time step, this is the result. Right. So I just barely start injected any fluid. The first, so there's only four grid blocks. The first grid block. Is just opened a little bit. That's it. So that's the width. I mean, that's the width is that tiny little number, and it's all zeros. Because I've just barely started to inject. Right? So then, now I would put this in a time loop, and there's really no way to avoid a loop here, because right? you're you're marching forward in time. Right? So then I'm going to put this compute time step in a time loop, and every time I come through the loop, I'm going to my old converged width is going to be my new guess, right? So it started off, it was closed, but now I've opened it a little bit. I know that that's the closest, you know. And I'm going to continue to inject fluid, and it's going to, that's going to be my new guess. I'm just going to march forward in time, march forward in time, right? And so we'll, we'll do that next time. I mean, that, that itself is pretty easy, right? You just basically put that compute time step in a loop, and then just reinitialize the width the width that's returned from the compute time step, the converged width, becomes the stored width, right? The, the width at n. And you just loop over that, and that'll, that'll do that. You know, that's pretty easy. Um, so I may actually come to class with that done, because it's just one loop, one tiny little loop. Uh, and then we'll talk about, you know, at this point, we haven't talked about how we're going to grow fractures at all yet, right? So I may, uh, on Monday, I'll probably come to, to, to class with a code that's just one function more than this cycling over time, but all that's going to do is open, that's just going to, if I continue to eject, I'm just going to open and open and open. Then we have to figure out how we're going to make it run, how, how, the, how the cracks are going to grow. Right. Okay.